Since the early 90s, car manufacturers tried to predict where the future of motoring would go. Now, a small group of people believed that the future was turbine powered, as in jet engines in cars. Even though this sounds crazy, actual working turbine cars were produced. In 1954, Chrysler built their first turbine powered car, the Plymouth Belvedere Turbine Special, which was based on the Belvedere Sport Sedan. Now to prove that this technology is actually feasible, Chrysler drove this one off Belvedere across the US. Then in 1964, the most famous production turbine car was released. This car was accurately called the turbine, and Chrysler believed so much in the project that it was in the works since 1945, so almost 20 years of development went into this car. So backstory, testing started in the 1950s, initially on benches. Chrysler's engineers encountered numerous setbacks, the turbine engine had tantalizingly slow throttle response, it burned an immense amount of fuel, and it cost a lot of money to manufacture. Now you might ask, if it had so many drawbacks, why did they carry on with the development of the motor? Well, it wasn't all bad. The engine provided some big advantages too. Notably, it was smaller, lighter, and more reliable than a comparable piston engine, and required no coolant. Another positive was the fact that it could start in cold conditions. Remember, the piston engines of the 50s and 60s didn't like the cold. Now, like I mentioned previously, in 1954, Chrysler made their first turbine car. And two years later, another experimental turbine powered Plymouth left the Chrysler building in New York City and drove across America to the Los Angeles City Hall. The car performed well, and it didn't break once. The car ran on normal unleaded fuel, as well as diesel. Now, since the trip was such a large success, Chrysler asked its engineers to continue developing the technology, with their eye on one day selling a turbine-powered car to the public. So the next phase was perfecting this technology, as well as getting the public excited, in order to ensure a successful and profitable launch. So they started to run more and more tests, they did more road trips, and even installed a turbine into a Dodge pickup truck. They organized many events where they could hype up the turbine engine to the public. They did everything right, the American public already loved jet engines, and the idea of having a jet powered car was a dream come true to many. So Chrysler announced that they would produce 50 units of the new turbine powered car, and these cars would be sold to real world customers. The Chrysler turbines had bronze paint, bulkily built bodies, and distinctive jet themed styles. The turbine felt like the ultimate answer to Ford's Thunderbird, it looked futuristic and it was powered by the future, so what more would you want? Now this jet powered luxury coupe wasn't super fast, the turbine engine only produced 130 horsepower, which was on par with most of the V8s fitted to the competition, but it didn't need to be fast, it was made for luxury. Starting in 1963, Chrysler had hand-selected the customers to test the car in real-world conditions between 1963 and 1966. Precisely 203 drivers got the car for free, and Chrysler normally paid for expenses like services and insurance. In exchange, they needed to buy fuel and keep a detailed driving log of their experience. So things looked good. But at the end of the program, Chrysler donated a few of the cars to a museum. They then took a few to keep for their own collection and destroyed the rest. So none of the cars actually made it into the hands of real world people. But why? Why did it fail so close to the finish line? While the turbine cars had a very slow throttle response as well as an absolutely dreadful fuel economy. And even though the engines could run on any flammable liquids, drivers stayed clear of gasoline as it could leave deposits that might damage the turbine's blades. So is this technology feasible at all today? No, not really. The turbines used nearly as much gas while they were idling as they did when they were flat out roaring down the highway. And it's not like it sipped on its fuel. It was like a thirsty kid that just turned 21. It gulped down the gas. Now back then, having a bad fuel economy was kind of the norm with all the huge V8s. And even back then, this thing wasn't feasible. So imagine today. There is no way, with what fuel costs today, for a tech like this to ever be used in a road going vehicle. Now some manufacturers are still playing around with this technology. For example, Jaguar showed off their CX-75 concept car, which used two diesel fueled 
micro turbines to produce power for its electric motors. But I feel like we have better options to use as range extenders for electric vehicles. And if I'm honest, I feel like we have better options, period. Companies like Toyota, Mazda and Kawasaki are working on hydrogen internal combustion engines. So if we can find a way to produce hydrogen in a clean and inexpensive way, I feel like that is the future. So in conclusion, the jet or turbine engines are really good for many applications. But unfortunately, in an automobile, they just wouldn't work. The only exception, drag cars. So that was like a history and a summary of why the turbine engine didn't work. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I've got many more videos on any topics automotive related. So like I said, if you liked it, leave a like, subscribe. I'll check you guys in the next one. Cheers, eh?